JLS Brave New World welcomes you back to the second session of the day. JLS Brave New World has recently completed 100 episodes with over 3 million uh, views and has featured Nobel laureates Oran Pamuk, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, His Highness, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the Booker Pulitzer and Commonwealth Sahitya Academy Award winners, including Margaret Atwood, Peter Carey, Howard Jacobson, George Saunders, Jhumpa Lahiri, Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee, Edmund de Waal, and so many others. Those of you who missed our earlier session of the day, Intan Paramadita, The Wandering in Conversation with Shamim Black, you can find this on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF, or on our Facebook page, uh, Jaipur Litfest. Our next session today is The Making of Modern Britain. Andrew Marr in Conversation with Swapan Das Gupta. From Sylvia Plath to Elvis Costello, Frank Critchlow to Bob Geldof, Saha Hadid to James Dyson, David Attenborough to the Beatles. Each one of them has contributed in shaping the story of the modern United Kingdom. Andrew Marr is a leading British journalist and one of the most visible faces on BBC television, as well as the author of the recently released book, Elizabethans, How Modern Britain Was Forged. In this conversation with Swapandas Gupta, Marr discusses the living history of modern Britain and reveals how artists, innovators, and activists define the new era and how Britain's past has shaped the 80s and the 90s. Andrew Marr was appointed political editor of The Scotsman and then of The Economist during the Thatcher years, before moving to The Independent as its main commentator and serving as its editor during 1996 to 1998. After working for The Observer and The Express, he became the BBC's political editor in 2000, and since 2005, has been the host of his own weekly Sunday program, interviewing British political and world leaders. It is by far the UK's most popular and longest running such program. Maher is also the author of 14 published books on history, art, royalty, poetry, and novels, and has produced many TV documentary series including a BBC history of the world. Swapan Das Gupta is a member of India's parliament and columnist for major Indian newspapers. A journalist for over 30 years, he occupied senior editorial positions at the Times of India, Indian Express, and the India Today. He is the author of Awakening Bharat Mata, The Political Beliefs of the Indian Right. In 2015, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan and was nominated to the Rajya Sabha, the upper house of India's parliament. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section below and asking questions. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, just hang in there and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, the making of modern Britain, Andrew Marr in conversation with Swapan Das Gupta. Over to you, Swapan. Good afternoon, Andrew. It's evening here, but I think the marvels of modern science allow us to communicate these days rather seamlessly, which is quite a relief in this age of COVID. Now, uh, you know, modern Britain, I mean, that's a pretty, I mean, difficult one to define. I mean, traditionally, I think people have started uh, there, there was a time when it used to be defined from 1918, and I think the goalpost shifted to 1945. And but you uh, you've written a book called the Elizabethans, which unfortunately hasn't yet landed in India, so I can only guess what it's about. But I think the Elizabethans is a wonderful way of approaching modern Britain, 1952 to 2020. That's about 10 volumes of my first day cover collection, just as a, <laughs> I mean, how vast the expanse is. Uh, now, uh, if, if I was to sort of uh, begin with the, with the monarch herself, how has the monarchy changed? from 52 to now. I can once, uh, I mean, I think the Queen's accent has changed. I, 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 I saw a, a broadcast of, of the Queen speaking in a Christmas message or some radio thing in 52. And I think she sounds distinctly different now. Well, I'm very, very glad. Thank you for that very generous introduction. 
I'm very glad you started by talking about the Queen and about action. That is something I talk about in the book because the Queen no longer speaks the Queen's English. Um, like everybody else, her voice has changed over time. And in the early part of my book, if you want to get on in Britain, you have to have elocution lessons. Lots of work ambitious working class kids were going to learn to speak a much more uh, what we call received pronunciation English. And now people try and hide their so-called posh English if they have it and um, level down. It's been a huge change. And we see it even with the Queen, you're quite right. I think um, from her perspective, almost everything has changed. Not quite everything, but almost everything. She started off as she saw it as the head of the Commonwealth, the inheritor of the empire, one of the great global powers, a vast, vast Navy. At her coronation, the Naval Review at Spithead was just enormous. Scores of battleships and aircraft carriers and cruisers, what had been recently the biggest Navy in the world, it has almost all gone now. She's seen one of her sons marry a mixed race woman from America who has slaves in her inheritance. Um, almost everything has changed. And above all, like everybody else, the royal family has to cope with a much more interrogative and, if you like, impertinent media and world may asking many questions, uh, many of them justified questions about how they go about their daily lives. So that veil of kind of royal magic and mystique has been ruthlessly ripped aside. But yet at the same time, the Queen herself seems to have written above it. Uh, she's never been at the center of controversy. The rather old fashioned virtues of duty, uh, family, you know, all, 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 all those sort of things seems to stick by her. So the Queen has, I mean, the Duke of Edinburgh, of course, is another unchanging personality, but in a different Absolutely. sort of way. <laughs> so I think there's something quite fundamental here that you touch on, which is that almost all of us today are taught one way or another that our job on this planet is to express ourselves, to find out our own individuality and our own, if you like, innate genius or whatever it is, and express that as vividly and forcefully as possible. And I think the Queen has taken a much more old fashioned and much more uh, unlikely uh, role, which is to suppress her own personality, not to talk about her views, to sub subdue herself entirely to her role. She has become her role rather than an individual outspoken person. And I think that's what's caused her to survive for so long, to the point you're quite right, where she is almost uniquely in Britain, loved by almost right across the political spectrum and by almost all classes. Well, I guess the stiff public has gone out of fashion now. But, uh, and you, we spoke about accents earlier, but at the same time, class remains an abiding British obsession. I mean, I can really uh, see a British newspaper and talk about a particular thing to talk about whether you're talking about toffs or something else. Right. And class seems to uh, be absolutely obsessive as far as Britain is concerned. We have our caste system as well. And it has been very, it's much less rigid than it was. And there is a real conscious effort on behalf of most organizations to ensure not just diversity of race and gender, but diversity of class as well. Certainly at the BBC, um, if you come from a working class background and you've worked your way up, then you're likely probably to get a better position because we, we want to invite you in, if I could put it that way. But one really interesting thing has changed. During the 1950s, for working class kids, the grammar school system, which depended on passing exams to get into and was highly divisive and to many people very unpopular, nevertheless gave working class
uh, that they'd reached the top. Now, the reason that the Times newspaper had that splash was because of an extraordinarily brave and ingenious journalist called James Morris, who'd gone right with the team to the top of Everest. And he developed a, a, a very devious and sophisticated way of passing the message back that Everest had been conquered in code to London while evading all the intervening newspaper and other media organizations and keeping it as a Times scoop. So on the day of the coronation, the Times uh, had this world scoop about Everest. But of course, the really interesting thing is that James Morris is one of the very first transgender people in Britain. He changed his gen gender and became Jan Morris, famous, of course, as one of our great writers. And so I start the story with a transgender uh, tale. And again and again and again, you look at Britain. Britain has always been very diverse, sort of sexually and in terms of gender attitudes and all the rest of it. But throughout most of this story, it's been hidden away. And one of the, the aspects of the tale of the Elizabethans is how what was hidden behind the curtain uh, and by discreet language has now become open and, as it were, flagrant and proud and campaigning. And that is that's a huge, huge change in this country. I think the culture wars that we are going through in Britain and, of course, is happening all around the world. It's happening in India. It's happening in the United States is one of the aspects that I wanted to get at in this book. I've done um, traditional histories, if you like, uh, where you focus on the political leaders and the general elections and the ideologies and the battles and, and all of that. But it's always struck me that the really big change in my lifetime because I was born in 1959, this book starts in 1953, but broadly speaking, during the Queen's reign, the big change in my lifetime hasn't been in the outward signs, it's been what's been inside our heads and the way our mentalities and our attitudes have changed. And this book, Elizabethans, is really supposed to tell that story through individual lives. Well, uh, you speak about uh, the transgender issue. Now, uh I mean, I, I think a lot of uh, the La Labour Party has tied itself in a, in, a bit, uh, in a very bit of a tangle over that. And there have been sort of witch hunts against the individual writers. J.K. Rowling, I think, was, it has been at the receiving end of that. Uh, yes. And uh, has it gone too far? Well, it's, I, I, I can't comment on that because I work for the BBC. I'm not allowed to. Um, <laughs> All I would say is that there is an enormous gap at the moment between metropolitan and, generally speaking, youthful Britain. Um, so the, the Britain being broadcast out from the centre of London and much of the rest of the country, whose social attitudes um, are very much more um, old fashioned and who find a lot of this, frankly, bewildering. Um, and how we negotiate that, that uh, difficulty is really hard for Britain. I think it's hard for most countries at the moment, but it's particularly hard. And it's not just it's not just gender and sexuality. It's also race and history, because the other big thing that we've had to deal with, of course, is our history as an imperial power and how we feel about it now. Yeah, uh, I, I got to peek into this sort of the two Britons. If, if that, that's probably an oversimplification, because probably there are many more Britons than that. But I got to peek into the two Britons during the Brexit referendum, when uh, around the sort of dining tables of North London, uh, you came across people, hardly anyone who would say no. Uh, it, it was sort of no Brexiteer was sort of almost allowed into a polite society. And yet, and there was a sort of denial amongst the London elite or the Islington elite or something like that mm. uh, about the existence of this very wide swathe of Britain, which voted quite resoundingly against something which uh, everyone felt was a part of life. This being a European had become a part of life as far as many people were concerned. And it, 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 uh, they rejected it quite resoundingly. Uh, is, is, what, what, what does that tell you about the two or three Britons which have come into existence? Well, there's always been a gap, of course, between London and the rest. Uh, going right back to Tudor times, you can, you, can, um, you can find it there. There was a Scottish writer, one of the great um, early modern Scottish writers who compared London to the swollen head of a rickety child, he said. It didn't really uh, cohere with the rest of the country. 
So it's always been there. But I think it's been sharpened by, first of all, by the financial crisis. Uh, when that struck, um, it became clearer and clearer that there were very large parts of England in particular, the English eastern coast, the Midlands, the old industrial parts of England, which had been economically <coughs> very badly left behind, where people felt that the, the snobby elite London liberals had stopped caring about them, weren't interested in them. And so it was partly an economic revolt, but I think Brexit was also very much about what we've just been talking about. It was a, it's a, a, a revolt about values for huge numbers of British people who really feel that the world has either left them behind or ignored them or sneered at them and they feel um, disgraced and rejected. And it's, it's, it is about things like transgender rights. It's about the way life feels to the metropolis, which has done really quite well. London is still booming and is, is abnormally young compared to the rest of the country and is abnormally ethnically diverse compared to the rest of the country. And London values, many people across the rest of England feel, have been shoved down their throats and they've had enough. And this phrase, we want our country back, is an emotional and cultural reaction, not just an economic and political one. Uh, strangely enough, I remember Enoch Powell, with whom I used to personally get on rather well, uh, telling me about it in the uh, in the early 80s, about this sort of condescension, which had really uh, started get, getting into Britain. Maybe he anticipated it much longer. But there's no, uh, uh, but, but there's no doubt that uh, the, the demographic profile of the United Kingdom has undergone a huge monumental change. It really has. Yes. Even my own personal experiences, I first uh, arrived, uh, went to the UK in 1975. I compared to from 75 to now. Uh, it's it's just a it's just a complete transformation. Uh, my friend Simon Heffer, who is never short, uh, is ne never one for political correctness, uh, often says that. Uh, you'll be lucky if you find English as a fourth language when walking down London. But uh, uh, it, it, has that really race, uh, multiculturalism issues which have come to the fore in recent times, has that transformed the soul of Britain, as it were? I think it's a, there's a real fight now to determine what Britain is and what Britain will be. And that is very much part of it. I mean, it started when you first arrived in the 1970s. One of the stories that I, I, I'm interested in the book is you'll remember the great Grunwick dispute yep. where the unions and, um, as it were, the, the libertarian right, which would become the Thatcherite right, were absolute loggerheads. And it's very interesting, of course, that both sides in that dispute were led by people from the Indian continent. There was uh, Jayabin Desai, who was Gujarati originally and came via East Africa to Britain and led the, 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 the strikers, a very formidable woman indeed. But people forget that George Ward, the owner of the Grunwick factory, was himself born in Delhi and was Anglo-Indian, half Indian himself. His father had been working, I think, for the Indian railways beforehand. So um, both sides were there in an iconic dispute, which has in many ways defined how Britain even is today, because you can still see the, the division between people who uh, are inspired by entrepreneurialism and business and want the state to get off our backs. And that is very much the George Ward view. And then the, the more socialist so, uh, solidarity view of Jai Bin Desai. These are things that have gone right. I, I just make the point that both of these people came from India before, before that started in 1976, I think, to 78, that dispute. So it's been with us for a long time. But I certainly think all sorts of issues in Britain are being affected by multiculturalism. I'll give you a couple of examples. One would be the, the law of blasphemy, which had virtually died out completely in Britain. And the idea of blasphemy had gone. But of course, the emergence of a large uh, Muslim community in Britain has brought it straight back. And it is now something being argued about up and down the country. Um, another, another example would be um, the effect of COVID on Britain, for instance, a more positive example in terms of uh, minority communities. I think 63% of medical people, doctors, nurses, um, and other medical workers who have died of coronavirus in Britain, 63% have come from um, 
uh, black, Asian and minority communities, almost all of them from India and from Bangladesh. So the number of people working in the British NHS on the front line has been disproportionately uh, black and Asian. And that, again, has produced a lot of soul searching in Britain. Are these people properly treated? Uh, um, have they been given the, the roles and the equipment that they needed? And has Britain done properly by those people? Um, so it's a very complicated situation. On the one hand, it brings in what people regard as problems. It bring in, brings in um, threats to their identity. But this is never, ever simple. A lot of um, people who've immigrated to Britain over the last 40 or 50 years actually have a much stronger, more traditional sense of Britishness than native British people have. To give you one example, um, the woman Gina Miller, who led the uh, legal attack on Brexit. Now, Gina Miller, I put, I've compared her in the book rather provocatively to Nigel Farage, because they both have highly conservative, nostalgic views of Britain. Gina Miller was brought up in Guyana, then British Guiana, by nuns and by very traditional schools, which taught her that the rule of law was everything, taught her to revere the British constitution and to expect that in the end, courts and laws would keep politicians in check. So she became a lawyer as well as a, a businesswoman. And that really was the motivation from, for her attack on the Brexit issue of the government. She felt law had been misused. Nigel Farage, also leader of UKIP, um, but a great nostalgist for um, imperial measurements, the way things were in 1956. That, for, you know, the saloon bar at Lords in 1956 is basically how he thinks the world should be today. So they're both nostalgists, but one comes from Guyana and one comes from Kent. Well, it does sort of break a stereotype of, uh, uh, you know, what what is often heard in the demonstrations uh, about a racist Britain. I mean, you you may talk about uh, discrimination as far as um, some sort of institutional discrimination in the National Health Service. But yet, I think the amazing feature of Britain is that today you have a Home Secretary, a Chancellor of the Exchequer, and an uh, industry secretary, all of whom are British Asians. I mean, we would call them Indians uh, of Indian origin. I mean, that's something remarkable. It, and if you consider that in, until about 1970, you were wondering if you're going to ever get a black or Asian MP ever into the House of Commons. It's come along. You're, you're absolutely right. But it also, um, I don't know how common in India this, this phrase BAME is, probably not at all, B-A-M-E. It's used in Britain all the time. It stands for Black, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern. And it's a very, very bad phrase in my view because it lumps together all the different um, minority communities in Britain. Now, it's still the case today that if you are born as a, a, a man of Caribbean or Black African descent, in Britain, then your chances of getting on are relatively low. There are multiple ways that you're discriminated against, and I can see there is a big problem there. But in terms of the Asian communities, they have done overall much, much better. Now, of course, um, it's particular people from the subcontinent. It's not all Asians coming in. Um, I've, got, I've got one good colleague on the BBC called Amal Rajan, who is going to take over the entire organization. He seems to broadcast on every channel. He's a very, very clever very, very nice guy. And I said to him once, Amal, what's your, what's your background? And he said, Andrew, Andrew, Rajan, the clue is in the name. And, you know, there are, there are, so there are a lot of kind of well-off um, people from the uh, subcontinent who've come up who are not the average uh, migrant. But there's nonetheless, if you look at the British cabinet, if you look at most areas of British life today, it is, if I can use this word, multicolored in a way that would have been unimaginable, unimaginable when the Queen came to the throne. Yeah, I, th I, think, uh, I think that's pr probably sums up how, how much Britain has changed. Now, if you were to look at uh, Britain's position in the world, uh, the idea which was there in the 1950s of Britain punching above its weight, and in the realms of popular culture, I think we everybody still loves a period uh, drama as far as uh, 
you know, made by the BBC or by some other British company. And uh, ever, ever since sort of the Beatles, there, there's a sort of iconic status which has been given to Britain. Do you still feel that culturally, at least, in, in, in the realms of popular culture, Britain still has a great cachet? I oh, think it's it becoming does. too Americanized. I mean, the alternative is, is it becoming too Americanized? Well, I was going to say, I think that the cachet is still there. There are still a lot of very, very fine British writers, filmmakers, uh, and so on. And we have a strong cultural base. Um, by the way, I think almost as important, we have a very strong uh, scientific base. And I think the way probably that Britain has had most influence in the world in the last 20 years has been through people like David Attenborough, um, in alerting um, populations all around the world to the, the natural world and the threats to it, including global warming. So I think actually naturalists have been the most powerful, as it were, propagators of British views recently, not artists. But I think I do also think that, as it were, British cultural or soft power is hugely threatened by technical change. Organisations like ITV and the BBC, which are based in Britain, have their roots in Britain, and employ British talent um, to express themselves around the world. We are losing ground the whole time to the big American giants, to Netflix and Amazon. Amazon is the biggest new force on the planet at the moment, and we are marching backwards all the time and finding it very, very hard to compete. That is a, a political argument, if you like, for Britain, but it certainly matters around the world too, because if British um, cultural exports vanish completely, the world becomes ever more Americanized. And if you only see the world and your own past history through American eyes, you don't see it straight. And I think of the very, very successful, well-made, um, but American-funded series about the royal family, The Crown. That is very much an American view of the British royal family, and it omits many things that British people themselves would like to see there, subtleties that aren't there, however well-made it is. Yeah, uh, and that brings me to, to, to this entire question of uh, the post-EU Britain and how it's going to define itself. I mean, there are sort of, there are a few people who would go with Nigel Farage and talk about, you know, at least emotionally of the old imperial system. But then there are others, like Boris Johnson, who would say, you know, what we need to do is to create a new Singapore. Uh, in our own way, where the... So, between the two, how do you think in the coming days Britain is going to define itself vis-a-vis -vis the world? This is very, very hard. I think what we've seen in the last two months in particular uh, it crystallizes the problem that Britain has. A country which is Britain's sized, you know, relatively modestly sized country in the modern world needs friends, needs alliances. And um, we were caught between the Americans and the Chinese, frankly, when it comes to Huawei and the 5G license. A great deal of suspicion amongst the West about Chinese companies and where they really report to and to what extent they are actually controlled by the Communist Party in Beijing and therefore whether they can be trusted to run our networks and many of our other systems as well, including our nuclear power stations, which they also want to run. So we've got um, the, the temptation to be as friendly and soft and gentle as possible to the Chinese government because we need them economically. And at the same time, the Americans saying, no, 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 you keep away or you'll get into trouble with us over our trade deal. As between choosing between Trump's America and Xi's Beijing, that's a very hard choice for Britain, but it's one we have to make. We can't dodge it. Um, if you're inside the EU, then you have a certain protective wall around you for those kind of decisions. Outside, they're sharper and harder. That doesn't mean that the world won't work for Britain after the EU. It may well produce the kind of economic shock that galvanizes the country again, rather as Margaret Thatcher's economic shocks in the early 1980s galvanized the country. And despite all the loss of jobs and factories, forced the economy to grow again very fast. The same thing might, might happen now. We simply don't know. But it won't avoid our need to make very hard choices as between, at the moment, American influence and Chinese influence. Of course, we are reaching towards India all the time as a way through that and to other countries as well. Yeah, which which brings me to the question, you know, these shocks which 
have been there, which have been felt, the tremors. And I, I come back to the place you're soliciting in, Scotland. Mm. And I think this is the entire Scottish issue, which is uh, now sort of started to dominate the uh, British political uh, landscape as to whether Scotland will remain a part of the United Kingdom or not. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I have been telling colleagues now for many, many months that um, the Scottish story was going to be the next really big political story in Britain. And I think people are beginning to notice rather late in the day that that's the case. In Scotland at the moment, the opinion polls show support for independence running at 55 percent. So a majority for independence at the moment. Um, and uh, the SNP, as the Scottish government, Scottish National Party, are absolutely dominant. Now, there are big problems ahead for the SNP as well, including personal problems between the former leader, Alex Salmond, and the current leader, Nicola Sturgeon. Um, but that fundamental position where most people in Scotland used to think that Scot the Scottish economy was too small and they wouldn't be able to survive outside the UK, the balance has shifted. Boris Johnson is hugely popular amongst swathes of the English electorate and very, very, very unpopular in Scotland. And from the, from the point of view of the future of the UK, there is an almost perfect storm. Scotland voted to stay inside the EU and was, from the point of view of Edinburgh, rather ignored. Um, Britain is run by a Conservative leader almost uniquely unpopular in Scotland. His brand of kind of English, jovial, uh, Etonian humour and so forth does not go down well north of the border. People don't get it, and don't like it. Um, and the SNP, frankly, by comparison with London, has had a better COVID crisis. Uh, proportionally, fewer people have died. Scotland has got on top of the, uh, the virus at the moment more successfully than England. And there are lots of people in Scotland saying we want to close the border to stop the English coming across. This is a very, very dangerous time for the British Union. Yeah, well, it's of course very so sometimes difficult to en envisage a cultural gulf between England and Scotland because I think there's a sort of a seamless adjustment uh, between the two. Um, so it, it's sometimes difficult for outsiders to, to contemplate the emotional basis on which this Scottish separatism is is crafted. But yes, you're right; it is real. But I, I mean, I'm in, to to come back to your comments about Boris's sort of rather schoolboyish impish humor, uh, which is quite funny and actually, I mean, he is quite funny at times, mm -hmm. but you've seen political leadership in, in the, if you look back at the Elizabethans, you know, right from Churchill, Macmillan, Eden onwards to Boris. I mean, what's, is there a, I mean, it seems to be a very, smooth evolution of broadly speaking the same type of people perhaps the only aberration was thatcher yes well of course um you talked about class earlier on and um if you look at macmillan's uh, cabinet at the beginning near the beginning of the queen's reign um lots and lots of old etonians and you look at boris johnson and theresa may's cabinet same thing so you're right there's a lot of continuity but below that there are changes and one change I am skept skeptical about, and you'll forgive me because we are both journalists. I am worried about the number of journalists rising to the top in politics because the skills that you need in journalism, which is vivid phrasing, a sense for, of controversy, good headlines, working faster deadlines and all that translates to one aspect of politics. It makes people sometimes very funny and good speakers, but the other political qualities, the ability to administer complex and large organizations, to think ahead, to, to understand data, those things are rather not present at the top of British politics in the way that they need to be. And I think we have a problem with too many journalists in politics. Um, so that's one, one issue we have. Um, however, I mean, Boris Johnson is in many ways a classic British leader. He uh, has a strong sense of history. Um, he adores and indeed idolizes Winston Churchill. Um, he has got a very well-developed humor and sense of language and theater. But maybe in the end, that's not going to be quite enough because he's under huge pressures that he never expected. The, the, the weight of scientific evidence 
arriving in his office every day. The latest figures on COVID and the need to take fast uh, science-based, medically-based decisions, which are unpopular around the country, will test anyone. But it certainly tests um, a vivid um, columnist from the newspaper world. Yeah, well, I, I thought, you know, you're talking about journalists dominating too many journalists. I thought the, the complaint was too many people with PPEs from Oxford. Um, that's the... Well, me, me, of course, lots of the journalists have PPEs as well. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> right. We'll come to some questions which have come um, from the audience, which is, and there is Ramesh who's asked, and this is talking about uh, the confusion over the COVID-19 strategies in Britain. Uh, what do you think would be Britain's world stance with Oxford potentially coming up with the vaccination for COVID-19? If I were to enlarge that, is there any, is the British strategy totally dependent, as it seems at times, on the successful vaccine? Or is there something more profound? Is there a greater degree of thinking? Uh, well, we're all praying for the successful vaccine. Oxford isn't the only team at the, at the forefront of that. There's Imperial College London as well. But there's certainly a desperation for a successful vaccine. And what I hear is they're doing well. And I'm quite optimistic about a, a successful vaccine emerging uh, between now and, the, uh, and Christmas time. We don't know quite what it'll be and quite when. But I think I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that. But no, the rest of the strategy um, I, I think many people, many scientists would say Britain locked down too late, about one or two weeks too late. And we were allowing people to enter the country from Italy and Spain, which had very high rates of coronavirus infection without um, quarantining them or indeed testing them for far too long. So there's a general sense among the doctors and the medical experts I talk to that we got things wrong at the start. But I think the government has learned those lessons and, in a sense, is prepared to impose quite draconian, quite brutal, fast uh, lo local lockdown and quarantining measures now. And we're seeing that in, we've seen that in Leicester, we've seen it in other parts of the UK, we're seeing it in Aberdeen at the moment. And we are seeing quite brutal decisions being taken by the government to quarantine all British people who've been in, for instance, Spain. And France is possibly next on the list. So I think this business of local lockdowns, a better track and trace system. We had a poor track and trace system, but it's now much better. So I think there's, a, there's two sides. There's let's get the vaccine and we're all begging and hoping for that. But at the same time, I think there is a more disciplined uh, lockdown, track and trace um, and quarantining system to try and, uh, what we say, whack a mole, um, knock, knock it on the head. Yes, although the British... Uh, obsession, if I may say so, with annual holidays is something which uh, goes against the whole nature of the entire culture of quarantine and, tri uh, and um, lockdowns. Uh, there, there's a question from Sajdev Ramakrishna. He asks, Mr. Ma, what is the place of iconic British institutions that lent it immense soft power in the, in the, in the past? Oxford, Cambridge, Wimbledon, the Royal Society? I mean, you, 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 you can see yeah. there's a certain view of Britain which is frozen in time, at least as far as India is concerned, at least mm. a particular class of India is concerned. Do you consider these to be the real uh, uh, soft power, iconic soft power institutions of Britain? Or has, well, it, has it evolved more? All those things are very, very important. Um, I think having um, at least two and sometimes by some counts more of the most successful or elite uh, research universities in the world is very, very important indeed. And yes, some of those um, globally recognized institutions when it comes to regulations over law and the city are also absolutely essential, never mind the monarchy. But I think that in the modern world, um, uh, media and media companies are absolutely crucial. And as I was saying earlier on, um, I am concerned about the Americanization and the erosion of British cultural power, British cultural independence, if you like, uh, where the, the, the big threat has never been Brussels. It's never been Brussels. It's always been uh, California, Hollywood, and those gigantic American companies. I mean, 
Amazon has a pile of cash higher than Everest, which you can spend on almost anything it likes around the world. It's a huge, huge force in the world. And taming Amazon, taxing it properly, and allowing um, indigenous cultural organizations, I'm afraid to say I would include the UK, the BBC, as an indigenous cultural organization to survive, never mind thrive, is a really big task for governments. How do they get together and rein in some of the behemoths of the modern world? I think that is the big question. Yes, it is a worrying thing because all, at, at the same time today, for instance, the British universities are, are in complete crisis over uh, their own funding. And that's going to be a big problem. And you may find a lot of universities having to literally close down or, mm. or Im, 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 sell sell their sort of intellectual assets to China or something. Like yes, that. yes. <laughs> well, we, we were talking just a moment ago about China, and that's a very good example. Um, uh, Oxford and Cambridge and many, many other universities have survived on the basis of many, many Chinese students coming over. And as we go into a rather more wintry period in our relations with China, that's going to dry up and stop. And that is going to add to the, the, the financial crisis for universities. Well, we're almost drawing a, to a close as, we, as far as the timekeepers are concerned. Now, the final question which I asked is, and Ria's asked is, uh, during your time presenting on television at BBC, have you ever had a moment when you've truly not known how to respond to a comment stroke view? That's hard. I'm trying to remember. Um, I was very taken aback um, a couple of times interviewing Michael Gove, who we haven't talked about, another journalist. And he has a very unsettling habit which I'll now reveal secrets of the trade. I ask a very clever, thought-through question I've been thinking about for days, and he replies, yes, <laughs> or no. And, and that is very, very hard because, you know, you're assuming there's going to be a lengthy reply and he suddenly stops short. There must be a, it's a cricketing term almost. Uh, he's sort of dead balls here, that's hard. Um, I had a very, very hard time with Gordon Brown a long time ago um, when we, um, he was having terrible tantrums in uh, in government, and I was hearing about them from people who'd been on the other side of them. And you know, crockery being smashed and screaming and shouting and so on when he was being very uh, going through a very unhappy period as prime minister. And I asked him about it, but I made a cra classic journalist's mistake because there'd been rumours that he'd been using pills to help calm him down. And instead of saying, "Prime Minister, have you been?" Um, experiencing uncontrollable rages while in office? To which the answer would have to be yes. Um, I asked him, have you been using pills to calm yourself down? And he absolutely went for me and he said, that's an outrageous personal slur and question. And I don't know whether he had or not, but he probably hadn't. And that was my biggest mistake as a journalist. I've never forgotten it and I've never let myself, uh, never forgiven myself for it entirely. But no, I think most of in, most times uh, uh, these days I go into an interview well prepared, thinking ahead. The job of the editor is to tell me what he thinks the interviewee will say ahead of time and how we deal with what the interview so, so we game all these interviews at great length. And that mostly pays off. I think, well, there's one thing about the British tradition of journalism is that it incorporates an enormous degree of insolence, which I think in India would be unimaginable. Uh, but thank you very much, Andrew, for a wonderfully uh, stimulating uh, conversation which we've had. And I hope your book, The Elizabethans, which I look forward to arriving in India, uh, once the flights resume. I mean, I, well, th I think people like me who love the hard copy rather than the Kindle version. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure you get uh, uh, one, one little secret. It hasn't been published in Britain yet either. I uh, saw that it's been re released in Waterstones or something like that today. Well, it shouldn't have been. It's not allowed <laughs> to have been. Um, I hope it hasn't been. But anyway, this is the first time I've had a conversation about it. It's been a very enjoyable conversation and you've been very generous to me no difficult question that I was, was stumped by, but a lot of generosity. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Swapan, and thank you so much, Andrew. Andrew, there's one question that's been buzzing on my phone ever since the interview started by people across America and Canada, which is, will Prince Harry come back to the UK? 
I think on balance, no. I think he has he has been torn between his love for Meghan Markle, um, and and that involves a different lifestyle. It involves different attitudes, um, and it involves a different way of living. And I think he has made that choice. And I don't hear any indications that he's regretting it or that he will come back. I think that was a one-way door, and he's gone through it. And will it have an impact on Britain's tourism and, of course, the palace itself? Well, we've, we have lost a very, very charismatic and attractive couple who millions of millions of people enjoy reading about and hearing from and looking to. And that is a huge loss for the royal family. But there was clearly tensions inside the royal family. And it's been very interesting since they've gone how uh, Prince William and Kate have, as it were, stepped in and dominate so many front pages and so many broadcast stories. The royal family has clearly taken some kind of decision that they, that, that the heir, the heir of the heir, as it were, uh, Prince William and Kate, who used to be Kate Middleton, used to be a middle class English girl, are going to be the dominant faces of the British royal family going forward. Thank you so much, Andrew Marr. Thank you so much, Swapan Das Gupta. And thank you all for asking your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't send all your questions across uh, because of the lack of time. Please do remember to log in on Saturday, the 8th of August, for another set of great sessions. We begin with Red Carpets and Other Banana Skins, Rupert Everett in conversation with Sandeep Roy. An element of drama has always attended Rupert Everett, even before he swept to fame with his outstanding performance in another country. He has spent his life surrounded by extraordinary people and witnessed extraordinary events. He was in Moscow during the fall of communism, in Berlin the night the wall came down, and in downtown Manhattan on September the 11th. By the age of 17, he was friends with Andy Warhol and Bianca Jagger, and since then he's been up close and personal with the greatest in the world. He talks about his life, a captivating story of love, fame, glamour, gossip, and drama. And this will be at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 2.30 p.m. British Summer Time, and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The second session on Saturday, the 8th of August, will be California Dreaming, Reimaging Silicon Valley, David C. Brock in conversation with Arun Mohan Sukumar. Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Stay well, stay safe.